Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on stewardship, entitled Stewardship, Motives of the Heart. This is lesson number six in that series, entitled The Marks of a Steward. It's the lesson for February 10 of 2018. And it's going to provide us some, with some additional challenges, I'm, I'm quite sure. In order to better understand it, I hope you have your Bible handy, and I'm going to ask you to join us in a word of prayer as we begin. Our wonderful Father, would that each one of us could be a faithful steward of yours, how quickly the gospel could be carried to the whole world, even if a small number of us were really faithful stewards. We think of people in the Old Testament who were faithful. and We think of Moses and Job and Daniel and others like them. And we think of the New Testament, people like Peter and Paul and Jesus himself, of course. May we learn from these lessons how we can be better stewards. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So what are the characteristics of a steward? That's going to be our focus for this particular lesson. And to be very specific, in our case, what kind of people will be faithful stewards right up to the second coming, through the time of trouble and so forth? We want to be people who would survive through the end time period, right? Do we need to have a clear and, 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 and precious relationship with God in order to manage to do that? I, I certainly believe so. Well. And so now let's just look at some of these characteristics. One of the prime characteristics of a true steward is faithfulness. Faithfulness means staying true to what we know is right, especially in difficult times, especially in the heat of spiritual battles. I don't know if any of you have ever had a spiritual battle. Maybe sometime you were arguing with somebody about something you believe, and it's, it's easy to sort of almost step over the line and make some statement about something and then later you realize, well, that's probably not really what I should have said. And then what do you do? Well, spiritual battles are part of the great fight of faith. They make up the individual battles in the great controversy. And our Bible study guide has some things to say about that. Uh, Carrie, could you tell us about that? If you love wealth, be sure to remain faithful to God and what he says about the dangers of loving money. If you crave fame, remain faithful to what the Word of God says about humility. If you struggle with lustful thoughts, remain faithful to the promises of holiness. If you want power, remain faithful to what God says about being a servant of all. The choice to be faithful or unfaithful is often made in a split second, even if the consequences can be eternal. Yeah, that's a serious thought, isn't it? Yeah. Look at a few verses that talk about primarily the story of Abraham. Look at Hebrews 11, starting with verse 8. It was faith that made Abram, Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. I, I don't know how many of us would be willing to depart to another part of the world. We had no idea what it was about, where we were going, what to expect there. We were, no, no Google Maps, no uh, you know, messages back by email. Um, he left his own country without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in a country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. For Abraham was waiting for the city which God has designed and built, the city with permanent foundations. And when, when Abraham was called, he didn't go right away. No. He, so God, God was rather patient with him, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, most of us have a wrong idea about where he came from. Right. Um, there are more, there's a, several different cities by the name of Ur in, in the Middle East. And... Unfortunately, a archaeologist back in the early 1800s found a city down in southern Iraq, and he found a, a, 
a piece of broken pottery that had the name Ur on it. He says, oh, guess what? I found the home of, of Abraham without knowing anything at all about what a, other, other possibilities are. It's almost certain that the Ur that Abraham came from is actually in, is in southeastern Turkey. And it's not too far from Haran where he, he went first and lived there for a while with his father and then his father died and he went on. And Ellen White actually, without knowing it, supports that document because she talks about crossing the, the, uh, the Euphrates River. If you're from Ur and down in southern uh, Iraq, you don't cross the river. It's already on the west side of the river. So she says, no, Abraham had to cross the, cross the, the Euphrates River and with all of his flocks and herds and everything and so forth. So it's almost certain that um, our archaeologist friend was wrong. So coming back to our study, uh, look at Romans 4.13. When God promised Abraham and his descendants that the world would belong to him, he did so not because Abraham obeyed the law, but because he believed and was accepted as righteous by God. And he, she, he, uh, Paul goes on to say in verses 18 to 21, Abraham believed and hoped even when there was no reason for hoping, and so became the father of many nations. Just as the scripture says, your descendants will be as many as the stars. He was then almost 100 years old, but his faith did not weaken when he thought of his body, which was already practically dead. And I have to chuckle whenever I read that because how many more children did he have? <laughs> he had six more sons Jesus. by his third wife. Or the fact that Sarah could not have children. Now that's a serious issue. His faith did not leave him and he did not doubt God's promise. Well, you go back to Genesis and you find out there was a little wavering there, wasn't there? He even laughed at God. His faith filled him with power and he gave praise to God. He was absolutely sure that God would be able to do what he had promised. Now, how many, present, how many promises does God give us that we're not too sure about whether he actually can deliver? Every good Bible student understands the challenges that Abraham or Abraham went through from the time he left his home, home, homeland until he died. These verses teach us that Abraham trusted God even when the promises of God seemed impossible to be fulfilled. The Hebrew word for faithful means trust. It is the same Hebrew word root which gives us the word amen. It really means to be solid or firm. Are you solid and firm when temptations come your way? Well, let's take an example or two. Gary, you want to tell us about Martin Luther? Preparing to speak before the emperor, the reformer Martin Luther read the word of God, looked over his writings, and sought, thought, sought <laughs> to draw, draw up it, his reply in a suitable form. He drew near the Holy Scriptures and with emotion placed his left hand on the sacred volume, volume and raised his right towards heaven, swore to remain faithful to the gospel and freely to confess his faith even though, uh, even should he seal his testimony with his blood. It's very interesting um, to read that comment. Do you remember reading the story of, of his, he actually gave his whole presentation in German and they said, no, we, we want to hear that again. He had to do the whole thing all over in Latin. He had to do the whole thing twice, two different languages. Hmm. wonder how well any of us would do with that. Well, there's some interesting and challenging verses. Look at Revelation 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid of anything you're about to suffer. Listen, the devil will put you to the test by having some of you thrown into prison and your troubles will last 10 days. Be faithful to me even if it means death and I will give you life as your prize of victory. Last week we talked about whether or not you'd be willing to die for what you believe. What does it mean to be faithful unto death? Endure until the end. Second yeah. Timothy uh, 3 verse 12 has some interesting ideas. 
everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Are you being, did you, were you persecuted last week? Anybody persecuted last week? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yet. Okay. Oh, maybe persecution was a thing of the past and maybe a thing someday of the future, but it's not, not for us today, right? We've got people in our country right now trying to get rid of the Word of God any which way they can. It hasn't come down the pipe yet to the, that's on the end of it. Well, a second characteristic of two stewards is loyalty to their master. Matthew 6, 24, let's just look at that really quick. No one can have a, be a slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and ma money. Okay? It makes it clear that we cannot serve two masters. There's a very interesting comment in the Old Testament. I wonder why maybe, th shouldn't this have been maybe the first commandment instead of what we have for the first commandment? Look at Exodus 34, 14. Do not worship any other God because I, the Lord, tolerate no rivals. That's pretty blunt and pretty straightforward, isn't it? Why didn't God say that instead of, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? It almost sounds like, well, you can have other gods just so long as you don't put them before me. <laughs> Another way it could be translated beside me. Yeah. So is God just determined to be the king of the mountain? Or does he recognize that if if we allow our loyalties to creep into our lives, other loyalties to creep into our lives, it is dangerous, maybe even deadly for us? Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting experience recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8. I try to imagine this. I've, I've tried to picture this in my mind a number of times. Solomon was ready to dedicate the temple that he had spent 11 years building. Something like, maybe it was seven years, I mean, for a number of years building. A magnificent temple in Old Testament times. And you can imagine, I'm sure, that royal people from other nations were invited for this presentation. I mean, Solomon said, yeah, you, you need to know about the truth about God, so come and watch. So Solomon built a platform, and he's up on that platform. And remember that, like the Pharaoh in Egypt was probably there, and some of the other kings back in those days, and they believed that they were gods themselves. They taught that they were gods themselves. And here's Solomon, the most powerful king in that whole area at that point of time, and he gets up on this platform, and he kneels down before God in front of all those people. Think of the implications of that. Well, in the process of all that, he prays a fairly lengthy prayer, and this is part of it. 1 Kings 8, verse 61. May you, his people, always be faithful to the Lord our God, obeying all his laws and commands as you do today. Think how different the story of the children of Israel would be if they had followed that all, all through their history. Wow. Well, there's an interesting comment about um, from actually King David to his son Solomon, found in First Chronicles 28:9. Uh, Dennis, can you read that for us? Sure. And to Solomon, he's, Solomon, he said, "My son, I charge you to acknowledge your father's God, and to serve him with an undivided heart and a willing mind." He knows all our thoughts and desires. If you go to him, he will accept you. But if you turn away from him, he will abandon you forever. Wow. So what is the relationship then between loyalty and betrayal? Are those just diametrically opposed to each other? Can you think of a Bible example of real supreme loyalty? I think of Job. And, John, and, John the Baptist. Yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, Paul and Peter and yeah, of yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Let's come back to Job for a moment. Who was his pastor? What Bible did he read? He didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a pastor. He didn't have a church to go to. 
How did he get to be, you know, so committed to God? He said, though he slay me, well, I trust him, Job 13, 15. The experiences that Job went through were beyond belief. How did he survive all that? Did he have, I mean, we know that Abraham had direct co contact with God. Do you think Job had some direct conflicts, with, con not conflicts, direct contacts with God? Could very well have been. Yeah. Although in the end, when God revealed himself, he seemed to experience it as a new experience. Yeah. So, but Abraham had taught his household and, uh, and that would extend uh, quite far and, and distant. Yeah. So uh, if Job somehow was uh, uh, even uh, down the line somewhere, that would have been passed on through uh, uh, Jacob and, and even Esau, perhaps. Yeah. Even though Esau had some wayward way yeah. <laughs> activities about him. But, uh, but he had he would have heard the truth and perhaps have you ever been in a in a Christian group or an Adventist group where the Christians or the Adventists were afraid to speak up for their what they believe someone's discussing maybe knocking the Christian church or I mean we live in a society now that's doing everything they possibly can to to discredit Christianity, Christianity. Yep. just amazing and what do we do when that happens? Do we have the courage to speak up? Do we have something to, do we have something honest and, and, and faithful that we can say that is a, is a correct defense of Christianity and of God? Well, Paul encourages us to be ready to give an answer to every man who asks for the hope that is within us. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Well, true stewardship requires a clear conscience. Look at a couple of passages, Hebrews 10, <laughs> 19 through 22. When we have then, my brothers and sisters, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He opened for us a new way, a living way through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God, so let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. So what does it mean to have a heart purified from a guilty conscience? It's a heart that's open to hear the truth about God and also the truth about ourselves. Uh, we have confessed our sins and we're, we're open to hear more of what, yeah. uh, what okay. he wants to communicate with Good. us. Good. Which would be a willingness to listen and take instruction. Yeah. Yeah. The Spirit says clearly that some, now I'm reading from, from 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. The Spirit says clearly that some people will abandon the faith in later times. They will obey lying spirits and follow the teachings of demons. Such teachings are spread by deceitful liars whose consciences are dead, as if burnt with a hot iron. What, does, what do you think Paul had in mind when he was talking about burnt with a hot iron? Well, maybe numb. It, it would be painful initially, but mm -hmm. but uh, if you se seared the flesh and it uh, you destroyed the nerve endings, then you might not. Yeah, depending on the how it, the body handled that. I think probably every one of us at some time in our lives have run across somebody who lies to us and then lies again to cover up that lie, and that just destroys trust. I mean, you know, that's just a real downer. Well, a hot iron could could be anger, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. What What's the role of the conscience? Somebody suggested it's like an internal compass that serves to monitor our outward activities. But a clear conscience needs a high and perfect standard to which it looks for guidance. And what would we recommend to serve for that role? The Bible, right? Well, look at Hebrews 9, 14. Since this is true, how much more, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? 
through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. Okay, that's a mouthful. What does it mean to say his blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals? Anyone want to take that one on? Purify. Well, blood, blood is a life, a symbolic mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. And what Romans 5.10 says, we are healed with, it, with Christ's life. Yeah. And of course, eternal life is to understand and know the Father and the Son. So how do you get that? Study the Gospels and then use that as the prism or the spectacles with which you read the rest of the Bible. Yeah. Well, by studying the life and death of Jesus, can we become so changed that our consciences serve as a more or less perfect guide? Well, Romans 2, 14 and 15, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, when those who do not have the law do what the law requires. Of course, yeah. what is the fulfilling of the law is love, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so uh, for those who, was it Romans 2, 14, here it is. Um, when the Gentiles, in other words, the non-Jews who have not the law, but do by nature what the law requires, they're a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts. That's our thinking, that's the yeah. way we think. Yeah. Jim, I think you have a, another comment there from, from um, Ellen White, Mind, Character, and Personality, page 328, 27, 28. Uh, every room in the soul temple has become more or less defiled and needs cleansing. The cobwebbed closet of conscience is to be entered. The window of the soul, excuse me, the windows of the soul are to be clothed, closed earthward and thrown wide open heavenward, that the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness may have free access. The memory is to be refreshed by Bible principles, the mind is to be kept clear and pure, that it may distinguish between good and evil. As you repeat the prayer Christ taught his disciples, and then strive to answer in it in the daily life, the Holy Spirit will be renewed, excuse me, will renew the mind and heart and will give you strength to carry out high and holy purposes. Wow. That's pretty, pretty impressive. That's a, that's a mouthful there. Yeah. God, in fact, promises us that if we will be taught loyal to Him, He will write His law in our hearts. And where is that famous passage found? 2 Corinthians 3.18, is it? Okay, that's one of the places. It's found out, basically the idea is found way in the Old Testament. Remember where that wow. is? Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Let me just read that. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although it was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will, put, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's a passage that's full of all kinds of incredible truths that uh, you know, we could spend a long rest of our time together, uh, you know, unpacking it. But we don't have, we can't do it. Uh, it's repeated, as you know, in Hebrews eight and Hebrews ten, and elsewhere references to it in the New Testament. Well, that's all God has ever wanted. He says, I'll, uh, all that. And he says, I'll be your God, and uh, you'll be my people. In uh, Exodus six, he says. I will take them to the land which they pro uh, promised their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it goes on, but they didn't listen because of their downcast uh, conditions that they were yeah. in. So, you know, if you don't want to listen, what can God do for you? So, think about it now. When you stop and, and, and think through everything that Jesus has done for us, how could we possibly be disloyal to him? We're free to do it. We're free to reject truth. Probably the earliest hint of a guilty conscience noted in the Bible is found in the story of Cain and Abel. While Abel brought the lamb required by God as a sacrifice and shed his blood, Cain chose to bring only vegetables. 
Carrie, I think uh, you've got the next one there. The death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's refusing to accept God's plan in the school of obedience to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, typified by the sacrificial offerings po pointing to Christ. Cain refused the shedding of blood, which symbolized the blood of Christ to be shed for the world. Okay, and that's an SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, 1109. Those are comments on the Bible text from Ellen White. All true obedience starts in our thinking. And where, what verse do we have to support that idea? That's the Tenth Commandment, isn't it? We must struggle in our minds with the challenges of being perfectly honest in all that we do and say. It may often seem like being slightly dishonest is an easier way to go, but it often leads to trouble. Obedience to God is our only safety. So, now I'm going to ask you a very practical question. Is it dishonest to say to someone we greet in the morning that we are fine when we really are not? Think about the people you meet in the morning and they're saying, I'm fine. I'm just fine this morning. <laughs> you, I'm sure you've all had that experience. Well, so, fine could mean I can take it. Well, <laughs> I mean, what is fine supposed to mean? I can take it. I don't need your help. <laughs> I don't need your help. Okay. Well, look at a couple of passages. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. This is how we know that we love God's children. It is by loving God and obeying His commandments. For our love for God means that we obey His commands, and His commands are not too hard for us. Okay, so John thought the commands were easy enough. Paul said in Romans 1, 5, Through Him God gave me the privilege of being an apostle for the sake of Christ in order to lead people of all nations to believe and obey. And then... In chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, but not all have accepted uh, the good news. Isaiah himself said, Lord, who believed our message? So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. Well, so, I mean, I don't think I need to tell anybody, I hope I don't have to tell anybody, that the gospel is, is God's story. It came to us primarily through Jesus Christ, right? The Bible authors didn't think that following God's law was supposed to be too difficult, but they recognized that true understanding and obedience comes only through a careful hearing and receiving of the Word of God. And then there's that famous verse in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, speaking now to Saul, which does the Lord prefer, obedience or offerings and sacrifices? It is better to obey him than to sacrifice the best sheep to him. And what, what best sheep was he talking about? The ones what? he had taken. The ones he'd taken from the Amalekites, right? Yeah. yeah. It is important to notice that in the New Testament, the Greek word for obedience is hupakoe, which means a humble willingness to listen. The thief on the cross could not do anything to prove his obedience, but Jesus knew that his heart and mind we're willing. For various reasons, that same thing may be true of some of us. So, there's, there's several stages in the process of being obedient. Can you think of some of the stages? What, what steps do you have to go through before you can be obedient? You have to hear something. You have to understand what it is that God wants you to do. What happens next? You have to choose. Well, you have to believe that it's, it, it is from God. Then you have to choose and say, yes, I will do that. And then what? Act on it. You have to act on it. And you have to have the ability. You know, you may not be able to do what, what God wants you to do. But if you go through all those steps and you can, then that's fine. If you can't, God is concerned not, not so much with the actual doing of the thing as he is concerned with our committing our minds to to doing it although his all his biddings are sure. enabling so uh, we can't really say that we can't do it there's some re remarkable people mentioned in the Old Testament look at this look at first Chronicles 
uh, 29, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. The four chief guards were Levites and had the final responsibility. This is talking about the temple. They were also responsible for the rooms in the temple and for the supplies kept there. They lived near the temple because it was their duty to guard it and, the, and to open the gates every morning. So these guys had a big responsibility. And over in Kings, it describes this. The men in charge of the work, this is talking about repairing the temple, were thoroughly honest. So there was no need to require them to account for the funds. The money given by for the repayment offerings and for the offering for sin was not deposited in the box. It belonged to the priests. So, you know, they, the money just went straight to the workers. No one had to ask any questions. They just did what they were supposed to do. Is that what we see in our world today? Everybody just faithfully doing what they're supposed to do without anybody having to do any special Fairs. measures and countermeasures and, and uh, the lowest to the high. It's everywhere. And we have to have these very strict hierarchy of responsibilities and you're responsible to this person and that person is responsible to somebody else and that person and you gotta you might sometimes have to go up the ladder to find out where the problem is and or other. Well, think about the case of Daniel, who was so trustworthy that he rose to the highest positions in two world governments. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's almost incomprehensible. In fact, trustworthiness might be the most important characteristic of ethics. Moral principles are the guide for those who are truly are trustworthy. They keep the, that kind of trustworthiness must be developed by faithful stewardship over a long period of time. So when we are faithful to God, will other, will other people notice? Yes, I think so. Do we have any evidence for that in Scripture? Look at Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, your light must shine before people so they will see the good things you do and say, man, I'm glad this guy, this Adventist lives here, right? No, and praise your Father in heaven. Can we correctly represent God and do it well enough so people praise God because of our actions? Well, how does the faithful steward respond to differences of opinion, to fads, even flattery? Do those things matter to a faithful steward? Well... He, Paul told Timothy in First Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, to the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. So, and there's things in there about sound doctrine and teaching and exercising the gift and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, the way to... To deal with them is not to sharply rebuke them, but to mm -hmm. appeal to them as these particular uh, close uh, people that would ordinarily be close to us. Gary, I think you have a next statement there. Remember that this earth is where we are to prepare ourselves for living eternally with God. Under 25 here? Yeah. We are to be faithful, trustworthy subjects of the kingdom of Christ, that those who are worldly wise may have a true representation of the riches of the of riches, the goodness, the mercy, the tenderness, and the courtesy of the citizens of of the kingdom of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 189 and 190. Very good. Um, I sometimes make a comment about uh, our work, my work down at the clinic where I see a lot of patients every day. And the, the, the people there, almost all of them are Christians, I'm happy to say. Not all of them are Seventh-day Adventists, but all of them are Christians. And we try to represent Christ um, to our patients. We recently received a reward from the people that pay most of our, uh, an organization called the, the Inland Empire Health Plan, IHP, which is the one that 
is responsible for the, for the health care of most of our patients, we received a reward that was almost unbelievable. We, we had a 95% uh, um, positive response from our patients. That's almost unheard of. Yeah. And I, I'm sure it's because we're doing our best to represent Christ. Well, true faithful stewards demonstrate individual accountability. Dennis, can you tell us about that? Uh, it has ever been the design of Satan to draw the minds of the people from Jesus to man and to destroy individual accountability. Satan failed in his design when he tempted the Son of God, but he succeeded better when he came to fallen man. Christianity became corrupted. Early writings 2.13, paragraph 2. So, in light of the other characteristics of true stewardship that we have discussed, individual accountability is surely an essential biblical principle. Think about Jesus' individual accountability to the Father. You remember his discussion with the Sanhedrin in John 8. Um, look at John 8, 28, for example. So he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And I have to chuckle when I read that. I know that the Bible, these stories are very serious, but uh, it's also interesting. Jesus had to say three times, he had to actually take the personal name of God three times before they finally realized what they was actually claiming to be God. And then what did they do? They took up stones to, throw out, to, to kill him. Yeah. Three times. Three times yeah. yeah, this is the name of God. I am who I am. That's the, that's the Hebrew, the Aramaic, Hebrew and Arabic word that the Jews considered to be too sacred to pronounce. And Jesus had to do it three times with, oh, so you're claiming to be, oh, okay. <laughs> Grab the stone, you know. There's a side issue in here. The, mm -hmm. Some uh, would say that in regard to certain knowledge bases that Jesus was just a child of his time. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the passage there says that he only said what the Father told him. So uh, basically they're saying that, that the Father wouldn't have known about these things either. Yeah, Jesus is either the true Son of God and our Savior, or other he's a terrible imposter. Just an absolutely awful liar and terrible imposter. And, and risk death in, mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. Well, in light of the other characteristics of true stewardship that we have discussed, individual accountability is surely an essential biblical principle. Think about Jesus' individual accountability. We've just read verse John 8, 28. We are accountable even for every idle word we speak. You remember Matthew 12, verse 36. And Jim, I think you have a comment about that there. Let it be borne in mind that it is not our own property which is entrusted to us for investment. If it were, we might claim discretionary power. We might sift, shift, excuse me, shift our responsibility on, upon others and leave our stewardship with them. But this cannot be done because the Lord has made us individually his stewards. So that's uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 177. So if God has given us the responsibilities, we are the stewards, we're not in a position to make somebody else the stewards of our goods. Well, think about the, 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 the characteristics that we have, we have been discussing, we've been discussing this week. Individual accountability, trustworthiness, obedience, loyalty, a clear conscience, and faithfulness. Um, are those the first things you think about when you think about stewardship? We're, we're certainly getting an expanded understanding of stewardship, aren't we? I hope that's one of the things we learned from this series of lessons. So how do you th think those things are related to each other? Do they, are these a necessary whole or, or are these are individual things that you could have some of them and not have the others? What do you think? Well, sometimes growth is uneven. Mm -hmm. You know, so you could be 
uh, better at some things than others, but, uh, okay. but really it's God that causes the growth. So if we remain in Him, He will bring about uh, the, the circumstances that will test and allow those, those qualities to blossom. Mm -hmm. Very good. Would it be possible to be loyal to someone in a bad way? Well, you could, uh, if you had been a Christian in Nazi Germany and you were loyal to your country, um, that would seem to be conflict of interest. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the worst examples of that are the angels who followed Satan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how could it be any worse than that? Well, Stewardship is not the easiest principle to teach. How should we as a group of faithful Christians pass along the importance of stewardship to our children and to our friends in the church? By example, for one thing. Okay. How can we nurture, actually nurture the maturation of the next generation of Christians? Um, how good a job do you think we're doing it? creating a mature Christianity in the generation following us. I think we are starting to wake up. We haven't been doing as well as we might have. Yeah. Is it possible to make stewardship attractive to young people? I think so. Probably a minority. Yeah. yeah well, if you, you know, if, if it's about developing a love relationship with with Jesus, then uh, the burdens are light, you know. Those burdens of stewardship become light if we, if we fully surrender to Him. But if we're just trying to present the burdens without Jesus, then that's, and trying to sugarcoat them in yeah. some way, then that's, that's not... Doesn't work too well, that right? That isn't going to work. Yeah. Well, how do we convince people that faithfulness and tithe paying and faith, faithfulness and representing Jesus to others is something that everybody ought to do? I mean, I can tell you that I've had the personal experience a few times in my life of running across someone who really wanted to know the truth. And you sit down with them and you explain the truth and so forth and you see them grow and then you see them become baptized and join the church. That's a fantastic motivator. I mean, you really, you really, you know, it's, it, it makes you glow. Um, well, certainly we would all recognize that these characteristics of true stewardship are not the easiest things to maintain. But just as a target for the archer provides a specific place to aim, these characteristics should serve as, a guiding, as guiding principles for the Christian. They should give us a sense of belonging, loyalty, and closeness to our God. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. You should think of us as Christ's servants who have been put in charge of God's secret truths. Now, we're reading from 1 Corinthians, so this is Paul writing from Ephesus to his former associates in Corinth. The one thing required of such servants is that they be faithful to their master. What do you think that meant to the people in Corinth? So why is faithfulness such an essential requirement of the divine government? I mean, is it, would it be safe for God to admit a few crooks into the kingdom? No. It just, it's just not possible, is it? No. Yeah, so... We need to convince people that it's really, really essential in the Christian life and the Christian growth that we become like Jesus and we become faithful. But don't people really reject the idea of wanting to live with the Creator for eternity? It's kind of a, a, a self... Uh, <laughs> we, we do it, our, or people do it themselves, rather than God said, well, I, you can't come in, I got this barrier because you... You, you, no, remember it says God 
says, I don't, or judge no one. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Father doesn't judge you, and I'm not going to judge you, Jesus speaking. So uh, we, we, we self-limit ourselves, or those that do. Uh, <laughs> this business of uh, the books are open, yes, I, the texts are there, but uh, maybe that's for part of teaching, but ultimately, the, we do the judging about God. Do we want to live with God for, and, and take instruction from Him or not? That's mm -hmm. Romans 3, 4, right? Yeah. Well, we know, for example, anyone, anyone who wants to excel in an athletic sport needs practice and practice and more practice. Some skills come easily and others do not. But those who master those skills to the point where they come almost naturally will succeed. Um, I think about the people who, who, who want to be great basketball players. They have to learn how to dribble. They, they can run down the court almost at full speed and still dribble a, Bible, a ball and they can with either hand and then they can put it up in the basket with either hand. They learn how to do all those kinds of things. Well, so do we need to, does it take a while to learn the skills of being a, a true Christian? I think so. If you bring your kids up, most of us have been raised with those principles, the simple version, and you mature up through it. Okay. Take, take the life of Paul. You know, Paul was, was a good student, and as the record shows, with, as, as a Pharisee and so on and so forth. But then when he finally began to get the right twist or slant on things yeah. with, with God get, visiting him, but it still took him some time to, as of study to reach in, and then he was so committed he did it unto death. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, God is very patient. Yeah. Well, now, um, we've looked at a number of characteristics, and there probably could be others added. By way of review, let's look at some things. There's a lot of passages. Faithfulness and loyalty. Uh, look at a few passages that we haven't looked at. Look at Matthew 6, 24. No one can have a slave of can be a slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. He, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And we read 1 Chronicles 28 and 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 3. It goes on to say, after we read verses 1 and 2, Now I'm not at all concerned about being judged by you or by any human standard. I don't even pass judgment on myself. That's interesting. Why would Paul say, I don't even pass judgment on myself? Did, was Paul saying, I don't even trust my own judgment? I'll, I'll leave the judging to God? Could, mean, could be read that way. Well, he said he mm -hmm. wants to do good and does bad. I mean, ultimately, it's only God's opinion that really counts, right? Yeah. So the opinions of peers fellow classmates, friends, even local church members are not what really matters. Faithfulness is not a popularity contest. It is a committed loyalty to God. Okay, now let's take some stories from the Bible that illustrate that. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira as recorded in Acts 5? What did they do? Lied. They had a piece of property and they said, we'll sell it and give the proceeds to God, to the church. They sold it for more than they expected to get. So they thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll just keep part of this for ourselves and we'll pass the rest on to church. Just, we'll give them what they expect to get and we'll keep the rest for ourselves. And what happened? They, died. they walked up in front of Peter and said, this is what you got for the property? Oh, yeah. Boink. Mm -hmm. And a little while later, here comes the wife. Boink. So God isn't too excited about split loyalties, is he? Think of the, of, of the rich among ruler. What was going on with him? Jesus said, if you, if you, if you want to follow me, we'll sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. It was, a, it was a divide he didn't want to cross. Yep. I think Ellen White talks about uh, 
labor unions and secret societies, you can't be members of that and, and really uh, be a follower of, uh, of God. Yeah. You can't, it's just human nature, you can't have two sets or a hierarchy of loyalties. You can have only one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, the next basic area we talked about was integrity. Uh, look at a couple passages on that. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 14, for example. Since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. So how does his blood purify our consciousness from useless rituals? We can't, we don't need rituals because they didn't get us in contact with, they only got us so far anyway in terms of contact with God, but uh, we continue to have things that separated us from God, but yeah, Christ, well, in Christ we, we have a direct access to God. Paul had grown up with all those rituals and those ceremonies that they went through, and he was writing to a group of young men who tended to lean in that direction. You know, you, if you do all these things, God will save you. And Paul says, nothing doing. Leave those things. God is, you know, he's, he can take care of you. You don't have to follow those ritual rules. If, if you realize what Jesus did and you follow what, how, all the meanings of his life, those old ways, you can forget them. So in order to have a clear conscience, we must exhibit integrity in all that we do and say. The word conscience comes from a Latin word, which is a translation of the Greek word synatesis, which is a combination of the word sin, that's S-Y-N, meaning with, and oida, meaning um, to know. Whenever we portray to others the idea that we are something other than what we really are, we are moving into dangerous territory. It can even lead to psychosis or mental deterioration. And it is particularly important that we are honest and truthful with God, especially in prayer. Isn't that uh, if hypocrisy? Isn't that mm -hmm. it looked like it would fit in there with that definition? Yep. Yeah, opposed to that. Yeah, I saw an interesting sticker on the back of a car today uh, that shows a, a, a young man kneeling before the cross, and it says, "God answers kneel prayer." I mean, God answers kneel knee mail. God answers knee mail. Knee -mail. <laughs> Okay, obedience and trustworthiness. Let's pick a verse here, 1 John 5, 2. This is how we know that we love God's children. It is by loving God and obeying His commands. And there's a lot of other passages there. As we discussed earlier, in God's eyes, the obedience involves a humble willingness to listen. We may not be able to carry out all we wish we could do. Think about the thief on the cross. And think about Paul's discussion in Romans 7, 14 to 25. The good that I want to do is not what I do. I do what I don't want to do. But our wills and our wishes need to be aimed in the right direction. Another scary motivation is fear. Sometimes people can say or do crazy things when motivated by fear. We, we sometimes see in recent years people in, in, in places with cameras focused on them and, and probably guns aimed at them that we can't see in the thing and says, and they're, they're reading us about how they've been converted to uh, strange religions and so forth like this. Uh, those kind of things mean nothing. It may lead to temporary forced obedience, but it is not acceptable to God. Each time we open the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy and read more about the life and death of Jesus, we have the opportunity to develop a closer relationship with Him. The more complete and accurate our picture of God is, the more we will love Him we will see him as he is. Stewardship involves two-way communication. That is what leads to trustworthiness. God sees that we are trustworthy and he gives us greater responsibilities. Ultimately, the mark of a true stewardship is his, his or her relationship with the owner. Well, back in 1890s, we, after going through some of the most difficult days of the early history of the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White wrote to the General Conference in session, and I think, Jim, was this yours? Or? There was one that was it was an extra that was left out oh, I'm in sorry. the first passage. So he could either I'm, read it or you could. I'll read it. 
in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people, if we will put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of the word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. If we walk in the light as it shines upon us from the living oracles of God, we shall have large responsibilities corresponding to the great light God has given us. And as I emphasized a number of times, we have more light than any other people in history. We have many duties to perform because we have been made the depositories of sacred truth to be given to the world in all its beauty and glory. We are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted to us to beautify the truth of holiness and character and to send the message of warning and comfort of hope and love and of love to those who are darkness of error and sin. What would she say about us today? Would she still be able to say that I have nothing to, we have nothing to fear for the future? Do we, have we forgotten how the Lord has led us in the past? How many of us have read thoroughly and comprehended well the Bible and the writings of Ellen White? Are we doing that? In this series of lessons so far, we've learned a lot of things. In this particular lesson, we've learned about some of the characteristics of true stewards. I hope you'll keep these characteristics in mind as we move on to other lessons. Faithfulness, loyalty, a clear conscience, being truthful always. These are things which make a difference in our relationship to God and our relationship to our fellow man. Uh, God I mean, think about the people in the Bible who, who were very faithful and true. I think about, about Joseph when he was terribly tempted. I think about Daniel and all that he went through. Think about people like that and how faithful they were to God. How many people like that does God have on his side in our day? Think about it. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father. What a privilege it is to worship you and to serve you. May we be faithful and true stewards of what you have entrusted to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.